Depot Cartels Regulations by Salzo McKenzie. Let's continue this series, in which I get to both ask and answer the questions. This gives me a chance to teach what I want to teach or say what I want to say without being distracted by questions that seem off topic to me. Although I sometimes brag that I'm skilled in giving a perfunctory answer to a reporter's question and then steering the response in a completely different direction of my choosing. Why waste the time? These are the questions I want to be asked and these other answers I want to provide. I can't say for sure that this method works for everyone, but it works for me. And this is my column. By the way, a belated happy Thanksgiving to you. I forgot to say it last time. Speaking of last time, the questions dealt with pokers, rules and regulations. And since I used up rules as today's word in the previous column, we're left with regulations for today. Although it's the same damn thing. We have journeyed through question number 12 so far. And common sense dictates. We move on to question number 13. Here it comes. Question number 13. Hey. Mike. You have contributed to several poker rule books in the past. What's your second favorite rule among those you added to the laws that govern poker? First, thanks for using the word laws in your question. If, in the future, I decide to talk more in this column about poker rules, there's an alternative I can use for today's word. Did you say my second favorite? Glad you didn't ask for my 32nd favorite. I think my second favorite rule is one that failed. It was my cards and action speak rule that I tried to foist upon the bicycle casino then called the bicycle club just before it opened near Los Angeles about 1984. They made the mistake of sending me off alone to put the rules together, so naturally I ignored their group meeting suggestions and came back with a rule book that read just the way I wanted it. Anyway, my proudest change was that I incorporated a rule saying it didn't matter what you said you were. Cards were all what you announced in the way of calling, betting, raising, or folding. Only your cards, as placed face up on the table, mattered in a showdown. And only chips in the pot, or cards actually abandoned, constituted your decision on your hand. Couldn't that rule be abused? Of course. But it's actually simpler and harder to abuse than most rules to that date or since. You could abuse my rule by saying full house when you didn't have one and causing an opponent to take your word for it and throw a flush away. And you could cause players behind you to fold by barking out rays and then just calling. There are all kinds of dirty tricks you could try if you're unethical, but that's called angle shooting and honorable. Players don't shoot angles. Besides, I think casinos should be ready to bar opponents who habitually abuse rules in unintended ways. The problem with having declarations be binding is that it leads to miscommunication and all sorts of arguments and even more angle shooting. If a player mumbles, maybe I should bet, and an opponent hears or pretends to hear just the word bet, well, the 
floor person gets called over and has to decide. Or maybe a player stares at him, opponent and challenges him with you bet. Same dispute possible. And a lot of players may speak strange English. Lots of opportunity for misinterpretation there. I say the best way to handle this is to let players get accustomed to this absolute regulation. It doesn't matter what you say. It's just table talk. Always wait for an opponent to put chips in the pot or to throw cards away. Period. I can't really remember if my rules got changed before the bicycle club open or after the roulette book was distributed. I think I remember that the roulette book was in circulation for a week or so. But I'll leave it to bicycle club historians to set the record straight. Question number 14. What's the sneakiest thing you've ever done with poker? Rules? This also involved seven California card clubs. They decided to band together and create uniform rules. They had committees with representatives from all the clubs and debated and debated. Finally, they reached a consensus and wrote their rules. Then they made the mistake of giving the final version of the Rale book to me to check for glitches. I found a few, but while I was at it, I inserted two new rules restricting tournament settlements into the text they'd given me to edit on computer. When the Rale book was printed, my rules were included. My guess is that nobody noticed, because everyone thought the committee must have added those at a meeting they missed. Who knows? All I know is the rules made it through, became law, and might still be part of the Rale book if it's still in use. Anywhere. I now publicly confess this grave wrongdoing. You can imagine what it feels like to finally get this off my conscience. There's Actually a song in the musical, a chorus line that will give you a clue how I feel. The character Diana sings it about her high school acting class. Look it up if you're curious. Question number 15. All right. You kept bitching about the second favorite rule. Question. So, go ahead. What's your favorite contribution? To poker rule. Books? That's easy. I wrote a general rule for the old horseshoe club in Gardena, California about 1980. It has been borrowed by many other Raleigh books and reads. Something like management reserves the right to make decisions that are in the best interest of the game, even if a technical interpretation of other rules may lead to contrary decisions. The intent was to keep unscrupulous players from using rules to unfair advantage. You see, it's impossible to create a poker rally book that covers all situations without inviting abuse. This overriding rule prevents angle shooters from taking extreme advantage to the discredit of the game. A companion rule said management could award a pot to a player who was clearly entitled to it, no matter what. That prevented arguments about whether the corner of a card belonging to the winning hand touched the discards and made the hand dead. If a player obviously won a pot, that pot wasn't going to be forfeited on a frivolous technicality. This series of questions